Good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us today. Um, today's guest on Best Business Minds is uh, Jeff Grimshaw, who has written a couple of books. One is called Leadership Without Excuses and Thrive uh, Frequencies. Uh, Jeff, could you please give us a couple of sentences on each book and uh, why you wrote them? Yeah, I happy to do that. Uh, and, and first of all, Mark, thank you for having me on. This looks like a, uh, a good looking group of people and I'm, I'm happy to be joining you this afternoon. Uh, at, at my home, uh, you, you helped me get me out of uh, contributing to preparation of Passover dinner this afternoon. So I was grateful for the, the, uh, the distraction. Uh, the, um, okay, so we've written two books and the first one is Leadership Without Excuses, as you said, and the second one is Five Frequencies. And uh, the, the real meaning is in the subtitles. The, the subtitle of Leadership Without Excuses is how to create accountability and high performance instead of just talking about it. And the subtitle of Five Frequencies is Leadership Signals That Turn Culture into Competitive Advantage. The common theme across both books is that it's a, you know, there, there are two books about two things leaders are always talking about and claiming are important, accountability and culture. And yet in a lot of ways, uh, leaders uh, in many cases do a pretty lousy job of operationalizing those concepts. So the books are about uh, simplifying them, simplifying the complex and making the invisible visible. So. Clearly, uh, this pandemic is one of the worst things that's ever hit um, the world and especially the economy and the business world. I mean, so much of the um, country is going to be losing their jobs and employees and leaders are scared about the future of their business. What should a leader do to keep their employees calm during the storm and stay focused? Uh, Jeff, did you hear me? Well, yeah, I did. I did. It got it got fuzzy there for a minute. But um, uh, there's a few things uh, I'm going to suggest. Uh, one is uh, human beings are creatures that are designed to reduce uncertainty. We're always looking for ways to reduce our uncertainty. And uh, one of the things that's challenging in volatile environments like this one is that uh, the humans that work for us, when they're reducing uncertainty and they don't get the straight scoop from their leaders, you know, there's, a, there's an information marketplace out there and when they don't get any information from their leaders, they go to the black market, they go to the rumor mill, which isn't usually very helpful. The problem for a lot of leaders is they go, well, there's so many uncertainties I don't, want, I don't want there to be communication until things are more certain. The problem is you don't get that choice whether there's going to be communication. You only get to choose whether you're gonna proactively participate in the communication that is already. I think uh, Jeff froze. Let's give him a minute, get back, out, get back on. Yeah, I got kicked off, obviously. I, I, I don't know if, if you right. got any of that. Yes, we did. Okay. So, uh, so the challenge is, how do you communicate? Uh, how do you help reduce uncertainty for your people before things, uh, when, when things are uncertain? A really great tool that I strongly recommend is communicating probabilities. And what it means is that you prepare, you, you equip all the leaders in your organization with a consistent set of talking points that says, hey, as of today, April 8th, here's all the things that we think are definitely gonna happen, probably gonna happen. Here's the things that are actually uncertain, like we really don't know. Here's the things that are probably not gonna happen and the things that are definitely not gonna happen. Communicating probabilities provides employees an alternative to the rumor mill. And, uh, and so even when you tell them that uh, here's the things that are really uncertain, uh, even that helps to reduce uncertainty because in a lot of cases, they think you've already made a decision and just not told them about it. So that's one big thing, communicating probabilities. The other thing that is great about putting information in that, those five buckets 
is it's a good forcing function for a leadership team. If you sit with your colleagues and you say, let's, let's uh, create a, a, a one page uh, uh, fact sheet that says, here's what we think is in definitely gonna happen, probably not, probably gonna happen, uncertain, probably not gonna happen, definitely not gonna happen. It's a good forcing function for you and your team to get on the same page, because I guarantee you, you actually won't have the same answers to those questions. That's one big thing that uh, organizations find really, really helpful for com competing with the rumor mill. One other thing is to, to uh, tap the wisdom in the system. People wanna feel connected. They wanna feel like they've got a voice in their future. One of the things we're running for a lot of companies right now is a strategic listening post where we're asking, uh, uh, where we're, we're giving employees the opportunity to weigh in on things like, uh, in two weeks, what do we wish we had done two weeks ago? Or when this is all over, what are the learnings, innovations, insights that you hope we carry forward? Or, you know, what's the biggest, single biggest question that's a source of uncertainty for you right now? And when you get that kind of feedback from the system, it helps you think around the corner, look around the corner. And that's another great way to stay connected while you are also, you know, in, in a crisis like this one, turning some of your attention from not just reacting, but to creating your future. How do you look not shell-shocked as a leader? I mean, can you imagine what the leader of Macy's is going through when they're having to practically oh, yeah. le le uh, let go of everyone? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is why leaders get paid the big bucks, I think. The, uh, you know, that it, it's, uh, you know, that your job is to not, part of what you get paid the big bucks to do is to not do your uh, emotional processing uh, with them. Uh, do that with your, you know, partner and your dog. Um, when you're with them, you've got to uh, really be focused on uh, serving them with information, even with that irrelevant information to them, even if that information is not pleasant to deliver. So how do you handle this layoff? I mean, there, there are massive amounts of layoffs. There are going to be people that you're going to be keeping. How, how, do you, how should they be communicating that with uh, the, their, the people around them, you know, the leadership, and with the employees who are worried about how they're going to make their, uh, how they're going to make their mortgage, how they're going to feed themselves, how long is this going to last? Is this going to be, are they going to take partial cuts, full cuts? You know, what's going to, how, do, how should they handle it? The biggest mistake I see leaders making is that they see this at Hold on one second. It's relevance to your people. Uh, so repeat that, we missed it, you froze out for a second. Okay. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest problem I see is, is uh, leaders who, when they have to deliver bad news, they start waxing poetic. They say things that make them feel better about themselves rather than uh, actually tailoring information that's as relevant as, as it can be to their employees. So for example, I've sat with leaders who uh, have said, uh, help me with my talking points for delivering these tough messages. And they start with, you know, in these unprecedented times and they start with, it is with deep regret and I've been like, dude, I have never heard you use language like that forever. Why are, you, why are you doing that? Who gets anything out of that? Let's, I mean, these these are painful messages to deliver, but why don't you actually speak organically to people? And so if you're somebody who, you know, says uh, this really sucks, then say this really sucks, but get there faster and be thinking about what information is actually going to be useful to them, relevant to them, uh, or context or sugar coating that makes you feel better, but actually doesn't better equip them to do whatever they need to do in their life in this really volatile and tough situation. So who's doing a good job of leading? If you're saying there's uh, good models, even past people who've done that well, or even right now, as you're reading the headlines or, or large companies or even small companies, who do you think is doing this well? And what's the takeaway? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm sorry, we missed it because you blanked out. Uh-oh, boy. Uh, is this, am I back yet? Yes, you are. Okay. You know, we're, we're all adapting. I'll, I'll be in full transparency. You know, I, my daughter came home from spring break and has never gone back. And so, you know, she's, she's online right now for one of her classes. And so we're probably, she and I are probably competing for the, the same bandwidth here. Um, the, um, so the uh, leaders, I was asking what leaders are doing a good yeah. job in this right now? Yeah. Okay. So some leaders who, who the examples that I think of, um, actually going back a few years, uh, one of the things that I think is a really great um, lesson here and a great principle is to look for opportunities for shared sacrifice. Here's what I mean by that. Go back uh, to 2008, the, the Great Recession uh, in Detroit. Uh, everybody has somebody in their family that has been laid off. Everybody's been laid off or knows somebody who's been laid off. And so things are really bad. Uh, one of the companies we're proud to work with is DT Energy, the electric and gas utility company. Uh, their CEO at the time, a guy named Jerry Anderson, uh, said, I actually don't want to lay people off, but we've got to take about $300 million worth of cost out of the business. So he went to the organization and he said, I don't want to lay anybody off, but I need your help to, uh, we've got to use continuous improvement to find these uh, cost cuts. If you will help me do that, then I will make a commitment to you that nobody gets laid off. So they work together. You know, you had half of their employee population is unionized, uh, but uh, they work together. They found the $300 million in cost savings. And so not only did they survive and not only did no, no one got laid off, but now you emerge on the other side of that with a culture that's stronger than the culture that you went in with. Uh, I'm a big fan of Nassim Taleb and he's written books like uh, Black Swan and, and Andy, Andy Fragile. And, and what he says is that if you're, you know, resilience is about your ability to survive. Anti-fragility is about your ability to uh, encounter stress and challenges and then come out uh, on the other side even stronger. That's an example of being anti-fragility is using this as an opportunity to engage together and shared sacrifice, rally your people uh, and, uh, and meet the immediate needs while building a stronger culture. Another uh, Philadelphia story that comes to my mind is going back even a little further to uh, the, the internet bubble bursting. Walt Buckley was the uh, chairman of uh, Internet Capital Group. You know, it was insane. In the height of the internet bubble, Internet Capital Group had a, a share price or that was, or a, a, a valuation that was, um, uh, sorry, a, a market valuation that was uh, uh, greater than GM. So it made no sense. And then the, the, the bubble burst and, uh, and they were like, you know, what do we do? And, and they're in excuse making mode like everybody else is. And Walt Buckley says to his team, let's leverage our assets. And they go, okay, well, I think we know what you mean. And he says, he, they list all these assets and he says, wait, you're thinking, well, there's an asset that you're not thinking of. We need to treat our mistakes as intellectual capital. And so let's inventory our mistakes and then let's charge back up the hill with, uh, with a new way of doing things than what we did before. I think that principle applies to everybody at all the time, treating your mistakes as intellectual capital. I think it's never more important than it is right now is that we can always, I mean, there's plenty of reasons for us to look externally and to blame the things that, that, that uh, we didn't expect and that have made our lives difficult right now. The reality is, is that almost all of us now have a little more time for reflection than perhaps we did before. Say, I bet there was a whole variety of things that even leading up to this, uh, we could have been doing better. We were probably making some mistakes. So let's actually, instead of rationalizing them away, let's inventory our mistakes. Let's treat our mistakes as intellectual capital so that as we're figuring out how we're going to survive and rebound, that we uh, are, are learning and reserving the right to get smarter. So I'm not looking for you to be critical of President Trump, but he's the one out there that we see as a leader. And I'm wondering, what do you think he's doing well? And what, if you were his advisor, would you suggest to him that could be better as he's delivering this information and handling this crisis? Yeah, I, I, 
you know, the, the thing that concerns me most is um, uh, the inability to admit mistakes, uh, the inability to, um, uh, you know, every leader that I have worked with um, that is successful right now and that I think is going to be in a better spot when this is over are uh, the kinds of folks who uh, fail fast who would rather be effective than right. And so, you know, from a, just a non-political uh, leadership perspective, um, uh, I wouldn't wanna be an employee in any organization uh, where uh, you have a leader who is so reluctant to uh, concede mistakes because if you're not conceding mistakes, it means you're not learning. And if you're not learning, you're gonna have a hell of a time surviving and thriving in the new normal. But what's the profile of the leaders that you've worked with who really are great at handling stressful situations? There's, a, there's been some really great research done over the last uh, 10 years uh, about uh, uh, the difference between uh, what, what these researchers I'm thinking of call reactive leadership mindset and creative leadership mindset. And so a reactive mindset in a nutshell is uh, if you are uh, in a mode where it's, uh, where you are driven by fear, where you, you know, stick to your, the play, your old playbook, where, you know, you need to, uh, a lot of it's about how do you uh, control as much as possible. Whereas if you have a creative mindset, um, you, uh, you, because you have, you're really not focused on proving yourself to anybody. Instead, you are focused on creating outcomes. Uh, and so that means that you reserve the right to get smarter. That means that you're very comfortable failing fast. That means that you are working very comfortable with 80, trying 80% solutions and experimenting. And if things don't work out, then quickly pivoting and trying something else. Uh, that leadership mindset is, uh, a great source of competitive advantage uh, in a, you know, uh, in a, in a VUCA environment, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And there's, and there's really strong uh, research to back that up. So what companies have you seen that have developed a culture that has become super resilient to, you know, we're in a constant state of change, whether it's something like 9-11, a pandemic, uh, the volatility of the marketplace, so what cultures have been set up over time that you think have become really resilient and that other companies should look to as a model? Uh, one company that looks really smart right now and that I, I'm uh, proud to, to uh, call a, a, a client is uh, Roche, the pharmaceutical company that's based in Switzerland. Um, I'm not revealing uh, anything that hasn't uh, appeared in, in the press. Um, you know, they, they decided two or three years ago that uh, they needed their leadership teams to do two things. Even though their business was great, they were sitting on a pile of money, they said, if we're gonna be prepared to compete against biosimilars and other things that are coming our way, if we're gonna be the disruptor rather than the disrupted, uh, we need to get engaged, we need to adopt a new leadership mindset, this creative leadership mindset that I'm talking about, and we need to adopt agile ways of working. We, we have to be faster. We have to be more customer centric. And so now as they're playing an important role in a global response to COVID, uh, they're looking really smart right now because uh, their focus on shifting leadership mindset, uh, again, where it's really about, uh, uh, in a nutshell, being more concerned about being effective than being validated as right, and then adopting agile ways of working, where uh, is a big deal, uh, is a big deal to um, uh, has turned out to be a competitive advantage for them sooner than any of us expected. Um, we have a lot of entrepreneurs on today's call, and the reason I started this best business minds was to help them stay sharp and help them overcome the issues that we're all dealing with today and, and make them sharper for it. So they're, right now, a lot of them are trying to raise money from investors. What do you tell these entre uh, entrepreneurs on how to handle their current investors and 
potential investors, and staying on task? Yeah. Uh, well, um, one of the things that I have gotten really geeked out about over the last 15 years is about uh, behavioral economics, which is uh, sort of the intersection of applying psychology to um, how people actually make economic choices. And so from a behavioral economics perspective, uh, I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to understand the emotional algorithms of investors and uh, potential investors. And what do I mean by emotional algorithms? Well, Daniel Kahneman, who's the father, a uh, grandfather of, uh, intellectual grandfather of behavioral economics, won the Nobel Prize in 2002 uh, for saying something that actually seems pretty obvious, but uh, sort of shook the, the world of economics upside down. And what he said was, is, is it not obvious to everybody that when people are making important, many of their important choices, they're not just, they're, they're not just uh, you know, going into Excel and doing very formalized cost benefit analyses. Emotions play a huge role in the economic choices that people make, like what they choose to invest in. That's why, you know, you know, so many of us, for me, for example, drive uh, an Acura rather than a Honda because even though it's almost the same damn thing, the Acura makes me feel a different way than if I was driving the Honda equivalent. So what does this have to do with your question? You have to understand the emotional algorithms of your investors or potential investors, and they're all different, they're all unique. But for 95% of them, two big drivers, two big drivers that are guiding their decisions uh, all the time about whether to give you more leash or not, or whether to give you any money at all, is how do you increase confidence for them and how do you reduce their anxiety? There, there's a lot of other things going on, but 80% of it, 90% of a lot of cases, in, how do you increase confidence or reduce anxiety? And so um, uh, giving, giving people straight answers, even when it's scary to do so, uh, giving people reasons to trust you because you tell them uh, what might even be, what might be unpleasant to share. That's one way that even if, it, uh, even if it's challenging to do, and even if you'd like to obfuscate, you help to build confidence and reduce anxiety. Uh, and that, that goes into their emotional algorithms uh, that, uh, are determining whether they support you or don't. One of the questions we're getting on, on from the chat is, do you, we think we'll go back to business as usual or is there going to be something different? And if so, what could that be? Well, I'm pretty sure we're not going back to business as usual, but I'm not a very good uh, uh, futurist. Um, but, but, you know, one thing that I, I keep thinking of is a, uh, is a Buddhist parable that uh, is, I think, very enlightening and, and probably timely. And, and, and the parable, real quickly, is this. The traveler's on an important journey, comes to a raging river, says, I don't know how I'm going to get across. This is really, uh, this is freaky. I don't know what I'm going to do here. Sees over in the brush this rickety wooden raft and says, I don't have many choices. I don't have many choices, so I'm going to see if this raft will get me across the raging river pushes it out into the river and son of a gun, this, this rickety wooden raft actually works. Uh, traveler gets to the other side and says, I don't know, that was amazing. And I don't know on this important journey when I am going to get to another raging river. So the traveler puts the raft on his back, continues on the important journey. It's a big raft uh, weighing him down and he comes across people who are like, dude, what's up with the raft? And he's like, uh, you don't understand. If it wasn't for that raft, I would not be where I am today. The traveler is 100% correct. If it wasn't for the raft, he wouldn't be where he is today. The problem is if he doesn't put down the damn raft, he's not going to get to where he's going. So a couple of insights from the story. Most of us have rafts we're carrying now. This crisis is an opportunity to put them down. We're probably going to have some rafts that help us get through to the other side in terms of our need for command and control that are probably not going to help us on the other side. And, uh, but the other insight from the story is that it's always easier to spot the rafts that other people are carrying rather than the rafts that you yourself are carrying. And so uh, I think for most people, it's gonna be a good opportunity in the weeks and months ahead to get some feedback from your trusted advisors to say, uh, 
what are the rafts that I'm carrying that were absolutely essential to get me this far. They're not going to serve me well in the new, new normal, so I need to try out something different. Other questions anyone else has out there for me before I go on to the next question that I'm going to be asking? So do you think uh, colleges, when there are ethical issues in the market, all of a sudden uh, schools like Wharton and Harvard come up and start promoting ethics classes and raise big money for that? But I don't remember when I got my MBA and I don't remember when I taught 10 years at Wharton that there was ever a class on how to handle adversity. Is this something uh, that should be taught uh, at business schools now? Uh, yeah, I mean, 100% it should be taught. And I think it's going to, it's really key. Uh, it's the key part of leadership development uh, when uh, uh, throughout the, the employee life cycle, the leader life cycle. The, um, uh, the, you know, one of the things that I think is really important when you talk about preparing people for uh, when it comes to ethics, for example, is uh, lots of organizations say they value stuff, but you know, values are what you stand for when it costs you something. So one of the things I think it's important to do is if you really wanna have a value-centered uh, organization, is to think about the moments of truth that people face where, uh, where you know, everybody knows what it means to do the right thing, but there's a temptation to do something else. Uh, whether something is, you know, what your principles are, are really the things that you uh, are determined by what happens in those moments of truth, uh, those situations where actually living a particular value literally or, or literally or metaphorically uh, costs you something. Um, but on, on, in terms of like, is this something that MBA students should be uh, learning in terms of adversity? Yeah, I think there's a, a whole bunch of things that, um, that we have learned through neuroscience, through, you know, human beings are actually hardwired to be really defensive, right? That's how we survived as a species, is our primitive ancestors were just hair trigger, had hair trigger defense mechanisms. And uh, we wouldn't have survived without it, but the problem is, is that our brains don't know the difference between threats to our bodies and threats to our egos. So even if, even if all we really learned in uh, training was how to get beyond our egos, and not see things as threats, uh, but really to channel energy into creating instead of reacting to threats that are merely to our egos, there's an enormous amount of unlocked business potential there. What kind of skill sets? Uh, and I think it's important because it's, we especially see the younger generation, any type of roadblocks that they come in front of, they kind of fall apart. They're not able, to, they're not as resilient. I'm 59 and I don't see the younger generation as resilient as we were, and certainly not as resilient as our parents were. And maybe we've kind of made them a little bit uh, weak by making sure everybody gets a trophy. So how, what, what's the types of things that they should be taught uh, that will make them more resilient? Uh, yeah, I mean, all the things that concern you, like participation trophies, those kinds of things, those, they concern me too. But, but here's why I have some hope. The, um, uh, uh, I, I've, I've seen in elementary schools where they have uh, on the wall posters that say mistakes are expected, inspected, and corrected. And uh, so, you know, expected meaning you're not a bad person if you have a mistake, but we are going to learn from them. We're going to inspect them and we're going to correct them. We're actually going to do something about our mistakes. I mean, I love that elementary students are learning that because, I mean, honest to goodness, if that was actually an operating principle in most organizations, we'd be in a better spot than we are today. The other thing that gives me some hope is, you know, is, and, and, and many of the people on the call right now probably know this, is that um, there's, uh, you know, now there's been a real reappraisal about what it means to fail. You know, now failing fast is a badge of honor. And uh, I, I, I won't use the, the four letter word, but there's quite, there's this growing movement of, uh, it's called F up nights. They say the word because they're young people, but F up nights where, you know, it's really about, it's instead of a TED talk, it's about uh, people going and talking about their biggest failure and what they learned from it. So that reappraisal about um, uh, mistakes or failures are things that we should rationalize away, make excuses for, and hide. 
turning that into mistakes or something where the only stigma associated with mistakes is if you're too dumb to learn from them. I think that gives me an enormous amount of hope uh, uh, about people who are coming into the workforce today if they bring that with them. Are there any historical figures that you've really said, man, this person was really good at managing in a crisis and what your takeaways were from them? Um, I was just, uh, my, my uh, brother gave me the, uh, that master class and, and my mom and I, my mom's with us during the quarantine. She and I watched the Doris Kearns a Good One uh, master class on presidential leadership. And my goodness, I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln, just the way that he put uh, a team together, uh, the way that uh, he led with uh, poise and with clarity of purpose and uh, is, it's just absolutely sobering. Like where would we be today if it wasn't for Abraham Lincoln? That's, it, it's, he, I mean, just, it's really amazing. Is there anybody in the business world that you also hold out and say, man, everybody should look to this man or woman and, and it doesn't matter if it's a well-known company or not, but is there anybody that you hold out there and you say, gosh, they're really terrific? Um, you, you know, I, I mean, I've been following what Bill Gates has been doing, and I think his, you know, I mean, when he said, let's look around the corner and start uh, building facilities uh, for vaccinations instead of waiting, I, just that, that foresight of looking around the corner uh, is, uh, I think is really important. Um, but just in really smaller ways, I'll just give you a, a quick example. Of, uh, I won't even say his name because it's nobody anybody would have heard of, but, and, and there's like 30 other people like him, but you know, you've got a lot of people working at home right now uh, who actually have nothing to do or they're under, underutilized because there's only so much of their job they can do from home. And uh, this leader I'm thinking of like most people, you know, he's got that quadrant of, you know, what's important and urgent. And usually he and his team were only getting to the things that were important and urgent. They never had the bandwidth to get to the things that were merely important, but not urgent. So now he's got this unexpected capacity sitting at home instead of, you know, uh, letting people just, you know, watch Netflix and, and pretending that he's going to get them to work for 20 hours a week. Uh, doing whatever he he said let's create do some agile design sprints let's go to that list of things that are always important to us but never rose to the level of urgent and let's get people on zoom let's have people working in cross-functional teams uh, working on these things that are really important and uh, so uh, he's he's keeping them connected uh, he's building collaboration and com camaraderie and actually solving honest to good bus business problems. That's being good stewardship of excess capacity. Not everybody has the ability to do that, but many people in this crisis have excess capacity and, uh, and there's an opportunity for them uh, to leverage that uh, in a way that addresses needs that have been out there for a while and uh, uh, builds a stronger culture that's going to help you rebound on the back end of this. Jeff, you, most of your clients are middle market to large corporations. And right. what do you think they're going to be investing in as, this, uh, as the crisis um, goes on, but also starts to dissipate, but everybody having in the back of their mind that this isn't going to be the last pandemic we're going to be dealing with in our lifetime. There might be more frequent, uh, just like uh, the, the environment is changing uh, so rapidly. So what do you think that, uh, or what do you hear from the CEOs that you're dealing with that they're thinking, this is the way we need to be investing for the future? Well, I, you know, I don't know specific things. If I, if I did, I'd, I'd be trying to leverage that information, I suppose. <laughs> but, I, I, but here's what I do know. What, what I do know is that everybody is humbled. And uh, when you're humbled, it makes you, uh, you know, sometimes you just double down. But, but uh, most people that I work with, it, it's made them curious. It's made them curious. And so the things that they were never open to before, they're suddenly open to. Conversations that uh, would seem crazy to them uh, six months ago don't seem crazy at all to them now. So just as an example, one um, energy company that we work with, um, you know, has was uh, always had sort of an acrimonious relationship with uh, 
anything to do with the environment. And um, they've, you know, they, they've changed their poise. They, they've, they've changed their posture. On, on the other side of this, I think in a, in a really agile outcome creative way, um, they are gonna be looking to partner uh, with um, uh, environmental activists and, and, uh, uh, in, in a way that would be, have been unheard of uh, even a year ago. So, you know, that, that's a very focused, fragmented thing. I just think you're going to have a lot of people who, uh, you know, the, the opportunity here, if that's uh, any guide, is that you're going to have people who are curious, uh, humbled, and therefore curious, and open to conversations, and conversations for possibility that they would have not entertained for even a moment uh, six months ago. Do you think that early stage startups that are, are, that are still lean enough to uh, pivot and responsive enough to fulfill current market needs have a competitive advantage now, despite the challenges in raising angel capital? I, I would imagine so. I think the, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in agility. I'm a big believer. I mean, I, I as an owner of a, of a small business, uh, uh, my team and I um, uh, are, have in front of us, like visually all the time, uh, our, the, our thinking about our customers and, our, and, and, and as best as we can tell, uh, what is it that they're actually trying to do and, and what creates value for them? Like what is actually going on for them so that we are making choices that are really customer centric. And so for our, our, our team, uh, our, our team, we have, um, for our team, we have uh, pivoted a lot. I mean, we have pivoted a lot in the last three weeks, uh, but tried to do so in a way that was uh, centered not on our immediate needs of the moment, but in terms of what are our customers going to need two, three, four weeks from now, two, three, four months from now. What's been the biggest failure you've ever seen a company who was a powerful company and they failed in a time of crisis now that company doesn't exist or it isn't what it used to be. And what was the lessons learned? Well, I'm trying to think of the worst, but um, you know, one thing that we talk about in, uh, uh, well, well, let me just offer this, because I, I, I'm gonna tell you this and it could apply to 10 different companies that I, I, I could name, but uh, lots of organizations right now are looking for things to cut. And so what they're cutting in a lot of cases, they're cutting lots of things, right? But one of the things they're cutting is that anything to do with culture. And what that probably suggests is that whatever they were doing with culture was just virtue signaling BS. Like it wasn't actually a source of competitive advantage for them if they're cutting it now. Because what I think the smart move now is to say, uh, if our culture is gonna be a leading indicator of our future success, so what is the culture that is going to give us competitive advantage? And culture is, you know, uh, can be an ambiguous topic. Um, the, one of the things I think it's important to do is just to, you know, social scientists say culture shows up in terms of what people know and understand, in terms of what your people feel or believe, and in terms of what they do, their behavior. So I think an important team exercise, executive team exercise right now is to say, what's our best thinking, regardless of what we use to ask in our engagement survey or whatever, in, in the emergent environment, what's a really important thing we're going to need our people to know or to feel or to do? And then to say, okay, so for example, if we need people to feel like this is a place where we really do want them to speak up and innovate and take initiative, or we want this to be a place where what they do is they learn and they fail fast and they experiment, or you know that they learn from mistakes instead of rationalizing them then look at what are the signals that you are sending that either helping or hurting you create that culture that's gonna be a source of competitive advantage for you in terms of, and these are what we call the five frequencies. You know, think about your decisions and actions, think about what you're rewarding and recognizing, think about what you're tolerating or not tolerating. And this is where almost everybody screws up in terms of what you're tolerating or not tolerating. Think about how you're showing up in informal settings and then think about your formal communication what you reward and what you recognize and then what you tolerate or don't tolerate are usually the ones that where people need to make the greatest shift. And if you don't do it, 
uh, that's, you know, th th those are often the organizations that tolerate things they shouldn't that end up in the dustbin of, of history. I, I think right now there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, now you just have to go looking for it. Like I, I started uh, this particular show as a way for me to learn about Zoom, but also to make other contacts uh, for my own business, uh, my different ventures myself. And I kind of look at this as a, a time that if you can afford to do it, is to learn new skill sets and so forth. And is that what you advise your clients is to start thinking about what new skill sets do their people need going forward that will help them weather these future storms? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, if you, I, I, I think even if it's just us, you know, either history or, or even if it's just ourselves are going to judge us uh, by how we, in our own spans of control, steward uh, the time that we have, you know, stuck at home, uh, trying to figure out what to do. Uh, that, um, you know, if, uh, if, if we only, uh, I mean, there are apparently some really good stuff on uh, uh, Netflix and, uh, you know, my family and I watch Tiger King like everybody else, but if that's what you spend most of your time doing, I think that's a really poor stewardship of a unique opportunity in history uh, to uh, uh, read up on a whole bunch of stuff and consider some opportunities to do some things differently and experiment. Because right now, you can do all kinds of crazy experiments, and if they don't work, uh, then uh, you, know, you get to uh, blame the crisis we were in. I think we... We started, the partners in our business started our business in the middle of the Great Recession. And I think it actually worked out so well for us because it gave us an opportunity to have a ready-made excuse in case it went belly up. So we were, you know, so that we'd go, oh, well, it wasn't us, it was the recession. And, and as a result of that, we, we did some things that were uh, not as conservative as they might have been. This is another one of those opportunities to try some things because there's really limited downside. Yeah, I, I've written six books, and one of the books I wrote was uh, about how to start a consulting practice, and now I'm taking the time to learn Zoom in order to offer that up uh, so I can teach people how to be consultants, because there's going to be a lot of people who are out of work who have to figure out how they're going to make money. So I see this as uh, a, a business opportunity for me. One of the questions we've gotten here on chat is, do you see any new C-level positions being created in mid-sized companies, and who will uh, who will have a seat at the table post-COVID? Yeah, um, I think the uh, uh, well, I, I I know the second part of that, which is um, uh, HR is going to either have a stronger spot at the table or no spot at the table in the future. You know if. I'm looking at so many CHROs who are really stepping up to show their strategic value, their mission critical value to the organization right now, and so many who aren't. And so, you know, half of those people will have a stronger spot at the table and, and half of them, you know, haven't deserved a spot at the table. And it'll be really clear that, you know, they won't be there in the future. I, you know, I get nervous when people call things uh, chief innovation officers or, chief or, or even chief learning officers, even though that's a thing. But I think whatever it's called, I think there's gonna be uh, uh, a greater focus on um, creating some structure around uh, looking around the corner and improving the organization's uh, resilience. And if you like the, anti, uh, the Nassim Taleb word, uh, anti-fragility, uh, uh, because, you know, nobody is going to want to go through this again as unprepared as I think many of us feel now. Aside from the books that you've written, which everybody should be reading, what other books on leadership do you uh, suggest that uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs of companies should be reading? Uh, okay, a couple of things. One is uh, that... Um, I was talking before about the difference between outcome creating leadership and uh, reactive leadership, which is, you know, more uh, ego, ego driven. 
And um, there's a great book on that called Scaling Leadership uh, by Bill Adams and uh, Bob Anderson. It's really accessible. I, I know when people hear me talk about that, they go, that sounds like some, you know, California new agey kind of stuff. But I think it's, they, they, it's, you know, backed up with a lot of quantitative research and I think they make a compelling case and it's really accessible. So I, you know, I, I, I strongly recommend that. I've mentioned the scene Talib a few times. Um, you know, some, he, he's, uh, the, the guy is very, uh, uh, Speaking of ego, ego, he's very egotistical and it shows up in his writing, but um, The Black Swan, uh, Fooled by Randomness, uh, Anti-Fragile have uh, shaped the way that I think every single day. And I, I think, uh, I, I can't imagine being an entrepreneur without having read Nassim Taleb's books. And, uh, and then I'm just looking at my screen here and, you know, I also just want to mention that Brad Mills, who I can see on my computer screen, is actually one of the uh, leaders who's got a really great story featured in, in uh, Five Frequency. So I didn't want to miss the opportunity uh, to shout out uh, somebody who is, you know, somebody who's a participant on the call who is actually uh, somebody who is uh, an exemplary leader. All right. Does anyone else have any final questions before we let Jeff go today? No, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with all of us today and uh, wish you and your family the best. I hope you'll stay healthy. I hope you have a great Passover. At least you're with your family yeah. uh, to do it. And uh, we look forward to continue the conversation uh, maybe in a few months and see what your thinking is then. That sounds good. Thanks for having me on and happy Passover to everyone who celebrates. Thank you. Have a great day.